On April 8, 1977, Edgar Dale is being interviewed by John Belland as part of the ECT Foundation Oral History Project. We are being recorded at the Ohio State University, Columbus, Ohio. Edgar, I've only known you for the last seven years, uh, which of course has been pretty much since your retirement. Uh, you had to retire in 1970? Yes, at 1970. At age 70. At age 70. It's an age that's easy to remember because you were obviously born in 1900. That's right. I ushered the, the uh, century in. Uh-huh. Are you going to usher it out as well? I hope so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you were born in, in North Dakota? No, I was born in Benson, Minnesota. And my so father went to North Dakota when I was about three or four and homesteaded there. The, he was, uh, did he migrate from Norway? Or? No. Neither my father nor my mother were were born in Norway. They were the first of the group who were born in the United States, but my grandfathers and grandmothers all were born there. They spoke, your parents spoke Norwegian. They spoke Norwegian, but not at home, actually. We almost never, I never, my mother or my father never spoke to me in Norwegian. Mm. Although I, and I wouldn't have known it very well, uh, except the easy things, and I also, uh, studied uh, for confirmation in, with Norwegian, although I was a first class who was confirmed in English. So I'm an example of that group, the middle group, where we shifted hmm. over completely to English. Uh -huh. uh, you uh, began school then in North Dakota. Yes. What was the town? Rugby, North Dakota. It's a geographic center of North America. Uh -huh. And if you go through there, you'll see a monument so indicating. <laughs> uh, were, were your parents farmers? My father was a farmer, and uh, I also owned a big livery stable, mm -hmm. which my son, when he was about 14 or 15, wondered what a livery stable was. Then he went into the garage business, mm -hmm. and he also was kind of an entrepreneur in terms of custom threshing and doing things of that sort. Mm -hmm. uh, you had uh, a number of siblings. Uh, yes. <clears throat> there were seven in the family, <clears throat> two girls and five boys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, uh, toward the younger end of that or the older? No, or? I was right in the middle. You were right in the middle. And all of us got college degrees and a couple of PhDs and then a couple of master's degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, someone said that uh, part of the reason for the tremendous achievement of people coming out of the plain states in that era was that it was the Dust Bowl time and you had to get out of there and do something if you wanted to survive. Do you think that was true? Well, I don't, I, <clears throat> I don't think it had much to do with it, because they were, they were leaving the farms anyway. They left perhaps a little sooner, but mm -hmm. it was a typical trend of moving, moving away from the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, so none of your uh, brothers or sisters uh, remained farmers? None, no. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, schooling you had in, in your elementary and, and high school years were in rural schools? Well, not really. If you, It all depends what you call rural. If you use some <laughs> kind of a statistical definition, it would be. Mm -hmm. But this was a small town, mostly. I started in a, in a rural school, but I only went there for a few months. Mm -hmm. And you went in town? You went to town, yes. How big was the elementary school? Then? Well, the elementary school, I had about 15 or 20 kids in each class. Mm -hmm. and, and high school? High school is also small. There were only about 50 in the class, although the high school graduation class had uh, 17 in it. Mm -hmm. what, was it compulsory to go to high school then, or did some No. Was, okay. So some finished at eighth grade right. and went yeah. back to the farm or yeah, something? Well, they, they would be on the farm, and or the, probably didn't finish high school and go back to the farm, although there was some of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I graduated from high school, there were 17 in the class. When I spoke to the high school class, graduating class, Fifty years later, there were over 150, mm -hmm. and the population of the county had not increased. Mm -hmm. It's one indication of what has happened. I mean, when you think, take those 17, the group that I was with, every one of them could have gone to college, and many of them did and, and been successful. Mm -hmm. But the group that I spoke to, many of them would not, not go to college, and some of them would not be able to make the grade. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the difference between compulsory high school uh, as opposed to in your era when it was a voluntary yes. and, and really kind of a special. Well, uh, there were decision points. Mm 
the kids decided at the end of the eighth grade that they would not go to high school. And that was a typical decision then. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. at the end of high school, they made a decision as to whether or not they would go to college. Mm -hmm. And, and um, nearly all of them could have gone to college in the sense of being able to do, but a good many of them did go. And yeah, then you, you, you got your bachelor's degree, and then you made a decision as to whether or not you would uh, do further graduate work. Right. You said that of that 17 in your high school class, a, a large number did go on to Quite college. a large number went on. And a uh, high degree of success. Yes, that's right. Uh, in terms of college, uh, uh, you decided to go on to college, obviously. Uh, uh, where was that? That was at the University of North Dakota at Grand Forks, North Dakota. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, were you interested in becoming a teacher? Well, I had no vocational choice at all. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to do. And I went into teaching largely because I ran out of money at the end of the first semester. and. Uh, the only thing I could do to make some money was to go back on the farm and you couldn't make any money there, so I taught school. Mm -hmm. In other words, after 1918, including 1918, I taught school every second semester. So you, you would go to college a semester and teach school yes. a semester? Kind of an originating of the Antioch plan or <laughs> accelerated education or so on. Right. Uh, how long did it take you to finish the undergraduate work doing Well, those? it took me five years to do that, but uh, I good. was basically yeah. f uh, five semesters, mm -hmm. and also examinations mm -hmm. and correspondence courses, which I found most fruitful. Mm -hmm. When I read about the Open University now, I realize that I went through that kind of plan a long, long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, uh, uh, until we've had the Open University recently, correspondence courses Know, fell into almost ill repute. Huh? That's right. Uh, but uh, you found them to be very facilitated. Well, I took courses with my, my the professors whom I knew. Mm -hmm. I also took a good many examinations in foreign languages and got credits there. Oh, so you knew the professor at the University of North Dakota That's right. from whom you were taking the correspondence. Uh, yes, course. it was really a tutorial program. Mm -hmm. I, I answered. I wrote answers, long answers to his questions. I had a typewriter and I typed well. Mm -hmm. So I, we, it was a kind of exchanging of a series of letters. Uh -huh. That was a un unique opportunity. It wasn't a mass-produced kind at all, of thing. No. Uh, I think that may have made the difference. That's right. Uh, uh, so it was quite natural for you then to go into full-time teaching since you'd That's been right. doing that all That's along. Right. Uh, what, where was your first teaching job? In a rural school near Rugby, North Dakota. Mm -hmm. Right near your, your home? Uh, yes. Not, not close, but enough so that I had to live with the families there, but uh, mm -hmm. 20, 30 miles from home. Yeah, they, they you lived with the various yes. uh, families of the children in the school. That's or, right. Or well, people in you the, paid board, as it you, were. Right. And they, uh, it was sort of a subsidized arrangement, though, too. The salaries were uh, pretty not, low. Not very high. <laughs> I got, I think, in a rural school, I got about $60 a month. Mm -hmm. But when I taught a, a seventh grade at Minnewaka, North Dakota, I had raised that to about $90 a month. Mm -hmm. That was a very good salary. It was good. Time. It was all right. <laughs> you lived pretty well on that. Uh, you, uh, during the process of that teaching, uh, if I remember correctly, you uh, rode off to Carlton Washburn in Winnetka. Yes, their the careers very often have very many serendipitous things by chance. Uh, one day when I was taking some work at the University of North Dakota, and I had not, I was then a graduate and I was a superintendent of schools at Webster, North Dakota. Mm -hmm. I walked past the uh, door of a professor and he called me and he said, hey, this, you ought to look at this, these individualized instructional materials. There's mm -hmm. a fellow named Carlton Washburn. He's a skinny guy like you. And uh, <laughs> he's uh, developing this new program. And so I got that material and I also developed what I call gold cards. So we provided mm -hmm. the parents not only with the regular grades and the typical subjects, but also gave them the scores of standardized tests, mm -hmm. and we graphed those so that they could see the progress that was being made in those various areas. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that I, I, here I was working on this program all alone up in North Dakota, and I wrote to Carlton Washburn, who was the head of the Winnetka schools then, mm -hmm. and asked for a job, and I got it. Mm -hmm. So you just flat out asked him for that. That's uh, right. And, uh, uh, he seemed to like to bring teachers in from a wide geographical base. Yes, didn't that's he? right. We had them from 
All, not, I wouldn't say all over the world. We had a few once in a while who would be from a foreign country, but that wasn't common. Mm -hmm. But they would be from a lot of different states. Mm -hmm. And, of mm -hmm. course, the salary was higher then than it was in most places. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of publicity about the Winnetka school system. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, I met there at Winnetka a number of, of very interesting people. Yeah, including uh, the person who was to become your wife. That's right. Uh, Betty Dale uh, was a teacher in physical Phys education? Physical education, yes. Was it elementary physical education? Elementary physical education at uh, the I Horace Mann School. At the Horace Mann School. Yes. That was, that was a, a, a apt name for, for a school that was innovative uh, in, in those days. It seems nowadays that people are still struggling with the idea of having a physical education program taught by a qualified professional in an elementary school, but Winneka had all those things... That's uh, right, 50, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, when did you start the graduate work at the University of Chicago? Was it while you were teaching? Right away, as soon as the first summer, uh, that would be the summer of 1925, I started, and I mm -hmm. also took some work downtown. I'm, with uh, various professors from the University of Chicago. They, they so I was in this kind campus. of learning situation all the time. Mm -hmm. Did uh, uh, you have in mind at that point the PhD degree and, and what the nature of the whole experience would be, or did that kind of evolve the way your uh, career objective uh, well, in undergraduate? Well, no, I didn't have it. I, Although one of my uh, professor, one of my professors at the University of North Dakota, when, when I said that I was interested chiefly in being an administrator, he said, "You know, Edgar, I'd like to see you get a PhD." Well, that sort of started. That was the seed. Mm -hmm. But uh, as time went on, I remember a conversation I had with Carlton Washburn. We were driving along in his in his Ford, mm -hmm. and I said to him, "Well, I have a, a lot of uh, experience in a lot of different fields, but I don't feel that I'm a specialist." Is that bad? No, he said, that's good. He said, now you can specialize. You can work on your, get, out, get your master's. And uh, no, I, I had the master's. You could work on the PhD. So I began mm -hmm. that. But it was still vague as to what I would do. Who were the professors in the PhD program that had the most influence on Well, you? it was Dr. W. W. Charters, who later came to Ohio State University and asked mm -hmm. me to come here with him. Mm -hmm. But they were all very alert persons. They had national uh, reputations, many of them. Bobbitt mm -hmm. was one of them. Was Morris. Judd still there? What? Was Judd still there? Judd was still there, and I had him as a professor. Mm -hmm. And uh, Morrison, who came mm -hmm. there from uh, Vermont or New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were all able. Mm -hmm. uh, they had, many of them had published, and I found them very stimulating. And by in that time, Graduate education was not so common, and mm -hmm. I was in a number of classes where there would be eight or ten or twelve people. Right, right. It was a, a, a situation in which you'd have a chance for a very close working relationship with the professors. That's right. Um, had you married Betty by this time, or yes, I met her. She came to. She was a teacher at Winnetka. Yeah, and then when did you marry her? Was that 1926? So that was during the process of the. Yeah, PhD she kept program. on teaching. I was in uh, 1926. I started at the University of Chicago, and she kept on mm -hmm. uh, teaching. So you became a full-time student, and that's and, right. And uh, she supported the family there for a well, while. Well, we have some discussions about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, yes, that's true. I was able to work the same kind of an arrangement. I guess uh, I think that's not too bad an idea. Um, you finished the PhD then in... Well, I took a, uh, I uh, got into the audiovisual field by... Uh, I had completed the courses and completed uh, the dissertation. And I uh, went to work for the Eastman Kodak Company for a year. They had organized a company called Teaching Films, Eastman mm -hmm. Teaching Films. Mm -hmm. And that had followed research on the value of films in terms of the information taught and remembered and so on. Mm -hmm. But I, got, I was awarded my degree the winter quarter 1928. Mm -hmm. And the, the work with Kodak began immediately after that. That's right. Uh, so you never really thought of yourself as an audiovisual person or the like until the Kodak uh, no, that's, job? No, that's correct. Uh, what did you want to call yourself as a graduate student? A philosopher of education? or? Uh... Well, I think I thought of myself as a curriculum specialist. Uh-huh. 
And I had all the courses they gave on that at Chicago, and that was my specialty. Mm -hmm. Bobbitt, of course, was then a big name in, in curriculum work, and, and so was Charters. Both of them had this whole idea of uh, analysis of uh, activities carried on. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we'd call it, I suppose, behavioral analysis. Mm -hmm. And then the evaluation of those materials and the putting those materials into shape for teaching and learning. You know, the very concrete approach yes. to curricular processes. Uh, a thing that we keep kind of coming back to, it seems, because uh, when you try to be ethereal or abstract about curriculum processes, nothing seems to change, does it? It's That's right. Only when you've become very concrete, very specific, and when it becomes actualized in terms of materials and people willing to work with materials that you get the curricular action. I think that's right. And then we also not only need the materials, but we also have to move ahead to help people use those materials mm -hmm. so that they, they become habituated to them. Mm -hmm. I think one of our great errors has been the fact that we thought we could produce a lot of materials, hand them over to the teacher, and she would use them. But she's still in her old system of habits. Mm -hmm. And she will do that during the period of time when there's an experiment on, there's a lot of excitement. But a lot of evidence shows that uh, when all that excitement is gone, the teacher moves back to her old position, mm -hmm. her, old, her right. own activities. Right. Um, before we get too far away from the Winnetka experience, um, obviously that had a great deal of influence on your development, and Carl Washburn himself uh, undoubtedly did. Uh, did you find that Winnetka had totally individualized instruction in those days, or what really was the Winnetka plan? Well, they set up a system whereby half the time was devoted to individualized instruction, the other half to socialized instruction. Mm -hmm. And the individualized instruction involved uh, analyzing a subject, like arithmetic, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and noting the key steps, and then preparing a set of almost textbook experience, so you would do a step at a time, mm -hmm. take a test on it, take another test on it, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I found it very fruitful in terms of, of tying this in with the charter's approach. The weakness is uh, the old weakness of any kind of individualized instruction, where you take it step by step and you don't have a chance to tie the material together to integrate it, and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And that, that difficulty has, I think, followed us right along. Uh, Winneka today is apparently still doing some of the same kinds of things. Yes. Uh, you mentioned having constructed goal cards, and I think the Winneka teachers still construct goal cards. Yeah. Uh, did you find them to be a effective means to uh, communicate to the learner and yourself and the parents uh, how progress was being, you know, what kind of progress and, and how quickly and so on, or, or did parents at that time still uh, press you to give their students grades or to compare their students with other learners? No, I think not. Uh, we had a, a very uh, thoughtful group of parents in Winnetka. They were deeply interested. They, the, the school was developed because one very enterprising man said, well, why do we send our children to private schools? Why don't we make the public schools as good as the private schools could possibly be? Mm -hmm. And so there was, all, there was always opposition of some sort, but uh, well, there was a study made of the Winnetka schools early, mm -hmm. and they found out that in almost every subject they were doing better than they were in other f school systems comparable, mm -hmm. except in spelling. Mm. Now, the curi here's a curious thing about reform in education. Now, the Winnetka schools only went up to the eighth grade. Right. Then they went to New Trier High School, which, which you know well. And uh, if you were to ask almost any teacher in the Nutria High School whether the youngsters in the, in the Winnetka schools were able and so on, they would say, well, no, they're not quite as able as the others. <laughs> and yet I made a study of it. I, uh, one of my earliest pieces of research, if you could call it that, I went down to the, uh, to the high school, got the grades of the kids that I had had <laughs> and of the others, and I found that... Uh, uh, the ones that I had had done a half grade better than the others, mm -hmm. and uh, but somehow or other we want to uh, we criticize the new mm -hmm. and sometimes falsify some of the evidence. Right, new new Trier High School has always been a very traditional 
or, or traditionally organized high school, right? It has very fixed subject uh, divisions and has uh, uh, traditional grades and all the other kinds of things. And, and there are a number of elementary school systems that feed that high yes, school. Yes, that's right? right. And so those teachers would probably tend to perceive children that came from Wilmette uh, who had had a more traditional education as being maybe more close to their value system or something like that and then suggest that the Winnetka kids weren't quite as good or uh, you know or do you think it was a more complicated thing well than that? the first complaint was that they weren't didn't know the grammar mm -hmm. well, now there, there, there are certain elements of grammar we were not uh, interested in teaching I mean mm -hmm. we thought they were not effective mm -hmm. but we finally developed a course on grammar and it became a textbook mm. and uh, we made up our minds that we were not going to sacrifice the excellence of uh, Winnetka because the kids would go down to, uh, to Nutria and not know the typical grammar mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so with the, the youngsters I taught grammar knew far more about grammar than I did when I was going to school and I think perhaps more than the kids from the other school districts there. I see. So the, one of the things that you sometimes have to do is, is to do traditional things, even traditional things, much better. Uh huh. That I think that's a good point. When uh, when you're trying to have an innovative system uh, to get acceptance, then one really uh, needs to sort of have some way to prove yourself. The cure. It's curious. Another factor now in this very building in which we're doing this interview, the university school. In the early days of the university school. It was noised around by professors even here. That the the youngsters coming here to school were not as good from the university school. Mm -hmm. Were not as good in the various classes. Mm -hmm. Now there may have been something to it, and they, and they were also saying they didn't get into the best colleges. That was completely false. <laughs> My daughter went to Oberlin, had no difficulty getting in. Mm -hmm. But there's again, I think that uh, you uh, have to do some of the tradition, not all of them some of the traditional things as well are better. Mm -hmm. And when people have started uh, improvising and innovating, I've said, well, take care of the fact that they can do certain things like arithmetic or whatever it may be as well or better than the, uh, the children who have not had the benefit of that program. Right, right. Well, uh, can we turn then back to that experience with uh, Kodak and the teaching film? Uh, <coughs> Was that primarily a research project or...? Uh... Well, it came out of a research project. Uh, the Eastman Kodak Company was asked to make a study of the use of films in schools and furnish the funds for doing it. Mm -hmm. and they employed uh, Freeman, Frank Freeman of the University of Chicago and Ben Wood of uh, Columbia University mm -hmm. to make a study of the value of audiovisual materials films in this case, and mm -hmm. silent films too. Mm -hmm. So they set up an experiment in the usual fashion. They had a control, control groups and experimental groups. Mm -hmm. They produced 20 films, 10 in general science and 10 in, uh, in kind of historical material. Mm -hmm. No, general science and geography is the other geography, one. Geography, yeah. And the uh, plans were very carefully developed for the use of those materials and the control groups had used typical other experience but did not have films. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they, then they gave pre-tests and post-tests. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking roughly, the youngsters having the films learned 15% more information mm -hmm. than the ones that did not have it. Mm -hmm. Although it was a curious thing happened, they let them, the school systems, choose their own control groups and the other. And they, they, the oh. idea was they are both to be equal. Mm -hmm. But it turned out that the schools had the control groups typically brighter than the others. <laughs> and they had a curious kind of reasoning, namely that, well, the control groups will not have the advantage of the film, so they ought to be just a little brighter and so on. Of course, it's specious yeah. reasoning. That's what you're trying to test. But they did better, and these would be simple tests of information what was in the film. Mm -hmm. so, so, and then, then yes, go then ahead. Then your project uh, following that, I I put the help put the information together and the Riverside mm -hmm. Press and so on. But then I, uh, they were also then had decided that they were going to continue to produce films, mm 
and I was the uh, producer of the guides. I wrote scripts and so on, but the material on, on how to teach the, the films we made, how to use them, and how to tie them in with other kinds of scholastic work. Mm -hmm. You were in this project for just one year? One year. So an awful lot went on in just one year. That's right. Uh, a busy time. Uh, was it to conclude after a year, or did uh, charters, uh, who had by then come to Ohio State, uh, in, induce you or uh, intrigue you about the possibility of coming here? Well, it happened that he had a project in, in uh, working with the, uh, one of the Rochester Technical Colleges, at, and so I saw him from time to time, and I began working on the Payne Fund studies even before I came here. Even before you came to Ohio yes, State? Yes, I did some work on that. Okay, uh, that'll be a, a primary kind of uh, topic for our next yes. uh, episode on, on these tapes. Uh, so the, the work with charters, uh, did, did charters and you come here at the same time then? or did No, he the, came here a year ahead of me. One year ahead. And uh, I, he was my major professor at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he just about got you finished up and then he came down to Ohio State. Yes, that's right. Uh, and when he came here, did he invent this Bureau of Educational Research and Service or was that already here and he just took it over? Or, uh, what, uh, what was the situation? It was already here and B.R. Buckingham, who was its head, had gone to Boston to head up the uh, Ginnon Company there. Oh, and uh, was it doing uh, a lot of the same kinds of things like school surveys and things before charters came or or did charters redirect the place pretty substantially well it was it was doing some of the same same sorts of things there were school surveys and studies of that kind there was a man here who was interested in spelling and he was doing some spelling studies but it had not reached the magnitude of course that it did under dr w, w. charters mhm mm mhm mm and uh, dr charters brought three young men from Chicago down here with him, in a sense. W.H. Cowley and Ralph Tyler and myself. Mm -hmm. Ralph Tyler had had a one-year sojourn at the University of North Carolina in That's Chapel right. Hill. And you'd had a one-year sojourn with That's Kodak. Right. Yes. Uh, and Cowley, uh, did he just come straight here? I don't well, know. He came that. straight here, I think. Uh -huh. He was at the University of Chicago working in personnel work. When you came here with uh, uh, to work for charters, you uh, came here for the specific purpose originally, I guess, of, of working on the Payne Fund studies. Yes, the grant had already been made, and so that was my first major work. The Paynes were an industrial family in Cleveland? Yes, the, the Oliver Payne was a partner of John D. Rockefeller in the early days. Oh. And John D. Rockefeller left for New York and Payne remained. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Mrs. Bolton, who was really the, the, the Payne Fund, I mean, she's one of the key factors in the Payne Fund, was a daughter of Oliver Payne. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, one of the other daughters uh, became uh, Mrs. Blossom. Didn't That's she? right. That's so my, yes. The and the Blossoms' uh, name has been very important in terms of arts and music. Other, and, music and yeah, a very distinguished family. Mrs. Bolton died just about a month ago uh, at the age of 91. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she was included among her activities in her career was being a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, what what was the main thrust of, of the pain fund studies? Well, the pain fund studies came about because there had been a number of comments about the films, Hollywood films, what they were doing, what they failed to do, and so on. And so Charters was called upon to give some advice as to what ought to be done. Mm -hmm. And he made the point that the, the subject ought to be carefully studied and uh, he pointed out that there were various divisions and various criticisms that were made. Here's the content of motion pictures. Mm -hmm. Here's its effect on sleep and health. Mm -hmm. And here's its effect in internationally. Mm 
And, uh, uh, but these were all opinions at this point. These were all opinions. There had been some writing. There had been a, a book written by W.H. Short, and uh, he had gathered together thoughtful opinions, but they were opinions nevertheless. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Charter said, well, let's move it out of that realm and into the realm of objectivity. And so he then analyzed the field, and, and uh, uh, here, was, here was content. What is the content of motion pictures, Hollywood motion pictures, mm -hmm. and so on. And so a number of uh, psychologists and educators were uh, asked to pick a problem and work on that, and, but to meet regularly to discuss the findings, what they were up to. And so I think one of the first studies of this kind of group research where the group uh, had a chance to pick a particular problem and uh, work on that. Did Charters continue to chair the group uh, or did you get some of those responsibilities early no, on? No, he chaired the group completely. Ah. And uh, so that, uh, but I was in 29, I had a chance to sit down with the eminent psychologists and, and uh, mm -hmm. statisticians and, and so on for a period of time I was working on the material and I found it very heady brew. Were, were the others all from Ohio State, or were they no, from... No, there was one, uh, Samuel Renshaw, who is still living, psychologist, did a lot of work with uh, perception in mm -hmm. the Army and the Navy. He uh, did the study on sleep. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, there started, uh, uh, there was then at the University of Illinois, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, he did studies dealing with some phase of content, the memory. Do people, people are saying, people don't remember what they see at the films anyway, they just, it vanishes. Mm -hmm. And so he made studies with a man named Holiday to determine what did people remember, uh, especially adults as compared with children and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so there were, there were a number of studies that were made which are reported in the summary. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, Thurston of Sh the University of Chicago made studies of the effect of motion pictures on attitudes. If you think about the, what's being said about television today, the same conditions obtained then. Mm -hmm. And there were also, I did a study on attendance because the Hollywood people had gotten a hold of a study of some man who pointed out that, incorrectly of course, that children did not attend motion pictures. And I made that study. Mm -hmm. And Charters made the distinction then between uh, the kind of research which is factual and also where you've got to stem a, some kind of objection that people had. Mm -hmm. You may have the data that uh, children do attend, but you've got to present it forcefully enough in some other way. In other words, to uh, reinforce what you already know and make it of such a character that people would believe it. Okay. Uh you did some other kinds of things, other specific studies yes. in the pain studies. I did a study series. of the content of motion pictures. Mm -hmm. And I had a letter just the other day from uh, Dr. Gerbner, in which he, uh, who is now doing almost the same kind of thing with television, and point out that the pain fund studies were the pioneers in this area. Mm -hmm. So you see the effect sometimes of studies done in this case about 40 years ago. It's still uh, cropping up and being used by new investigators. Right. I think you know it, it's re refreshing when that happens because so often contemporary investigators don't bother to uh, look back that far. They tend to think that the only good stuff occurred within the last three to five years or something and uh, uh, often miss, I think, very important material. What, uh, what do you think you know, could characterize the, the method of your method of studying the content of motion pictures? Well, we actually uh, we developed a set of instructions in terms of uh, criteria for looking at the material. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we did it in several different ways. But mostly we studied directly motion pictures. We had persons on our staff attend motion pictures mm -hmm. and uh, write out the information on the key points. For example, the age of the heroine heroines, what are the values? Mm -hmm. And we also got some scripts too and studied scripts. The, the people who actually went to the 
viewing to to view these motion pictures would go to a regular uh, movie theater. That's right. And sit there in the dark and view the, yes, that's the right. film. Uh, uh, did you have ways that they could get their notes taken uh, without too much delay? Or well, how after a while, they, they they knew what the points were and they could could write it down. And uh, uh, we didn't experience any difficulty at that point. Mm -hmm. And it was not, some of it was fairly detailed, but some of it would not be. In other words, what are the values which the hero and the heroine are pursuing? Mm -hmm. And one, one type of value was something where the gain came entirely for yourself. Mm -hmm. A second type was where the gain came, but it was to someone else, but you knew that person. And then the last would be called social values, where, where a policeman or somebody was working without any thought of personal gain or family gain or something of that sort and working entirely socially. Further. And that was not too hard, so although some of them dealt with details, but... Mm -hmm. uh, Did you find a need to send like two different observers to see the same film and compare their uh, evaluative judgments about that or uh, was there pretty good evidence of observer reliability. Yes, there, there was. I mean, the things we were looking for were pretty clear-cut, didn't involve a great deal of judgment after they got there. Mm -hmm. But then they would write, for example, they would write up the story, and then uh, in many cases we got uh, scripts as well. Mm -hmm. So when you could corroborate the material yes. from the script, the, the Hollywood producers were cooperative? Uh, well, sometimes they were. Uh, they were not uncooperative, but sometimes they didn't want to make it available, I think. Yes, I maybe shouldn't even just say Hollywood, because uh, film production for theatrical things uh, was still perhaps going on a little bit in New Jersey and some other places then, or had it all moved to Hollywood by the time? Almost Hollywood then, yes. Oh. A few things. They were, they were made use of New York City and so on for the scenes and so on, but mostly it came out of Hollywood. Uh -huh. They were then, by the way, producing about 500 films a year. 500 feature films? Yeah. That's... Uh, Pretty it's big lot. production, yeah, isn't it's it? Compared with it today, there yeah. was much more choice then in terms of going to a film. And, and it was a, a, a widespread practice among uh, adults and young people. Uh, kids went to the Saturday matinees That's right. almost every week. That's right. right. The average, I, my study of tenants showed that it averaged about one a week. One a week. Mm -hmm. How much did it cost to get in those days? Oh, 10, 15 cents. So Sometimes even in the Depression, it was a reasonable form of entertainment. Well, it, it did drop in the, de in the Depression, but the uh, Hollywood people were saying that there were 75 million people going to uh, attendances a week. And I just thought that was wrong. And, and uh, our studies of uh, receipts, for example, in Ohio, showed that I made the prediction that it was around 40 million. And later mm -hmm. on, statistical studies, very carefully ones, made ones, Show, uh, polls showed it was, it was 41. Mm. But in other words, they were claiming that a lot more people were going than were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know if they knew better or not. Mm. Uh, what kinds of, of findings did you have? Uh, uh, you know, what, what were the most typical values that were expressed? Well, I think about 75% of the values were completely individual. Mm -hmm. Whether good or bad, I'm not mm -hmm. saying. Then about 25 percent more to bring it. No, not 25. Uh, 15 percent more to broaden up to 90 percent. About 10 percent were social, mm. where the individuals like Pester or whoever it may be, were doing things for social values. Mm -hmm. That material is available now. It's been reprinted. Yes, right? the Arno Press has reprinted all the Pain Fund studies. Uh, and you went beyond uh, the, the actual research in the pain fund studies uh, effort to then make comment on uh, uh, ways to approach the viewing of motion pictures, yes. did you not? Well, when, you, when we reached, uh, coming toward the end of the pain fund studies, it became quite clear that there were things in the motion pictures, as there are in television, that we, we many thoughtful people disagreed with, but we decided that we were not for censorship. Mm -hmm. And the only al alternative then is, or the, one of the key alternatives, is to help people make judgments concerning these things. Mm 
to evaluate them. And so I was asked then to produce a textbook dealing with the uh, how to appreciate motion pictures is the way the title came out. Mm -hmm. And so I did that. I produced, first of all, a, an experimental volume uh, well, my, and uh, did that by and a technique I've used again uh, several times. What are the questions we asked the high school students that you'd like to have answered about motion pictures in Hollywood? Mm -hmm. and we took those questions and uh, wrote the, an experimental volume on that basis. And, so, and, and then we checked it with the students back again to see whether they enjoyed it or not, you see. And so mm -hmm. we got a good deal of information from them as to what they wanted to know. And we also then, with our uh, experimental volume, found out whether they thought we had done well on this or not, you see. What kind of questions did they want answers to? Well, they had questions about how they are made. That would be one thing. Mm -hmm and uh, what kinds of movies are there and so on, but a lot about the work of the director and the actor and the actress. And very little had been put into the literature at that time on the idea of the great film directors. Now, of course, mm -hmm. we have films showing the work of the great film directors. Right. And, so on. Right. and uh, we got our criteria from studying uh, the, uh, the motion picture reviews of then the then noted reviewers who uh, talked about the photography and uh, and so on. Did uh, the students seem shocked when they found out that uh, motion pictures were not made in the sequence that they were shown, that in fact many times uh, a series of close-ups were shot which were later intercut with other materials? Uh, did that I think, they, I think most of them knew that by that time. There, there's a lot of influence of movie magazines and so on. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, did it seem to have any impact on, for example, their writing? One of the things, I guess, uh, that we see over and over again are that, that even graduate students don't want to cut a written piece apart and resequence it in any way. They think if that's the way they wrote it down, that's the way it has to stay. And uh, I've often wondered whether learning about film and film editing and all that would have any influence on the way in which students approached our written communication. That's an interesting speculation, but I don't really have an answer to it. You know, the, the students didn't comment on that at that time no. or, or any no, other I don't think so. kind of thing. It's, many times it's hard to bridge uh, the, the or, or transfer the information from one kind of setting into another. Not that I recall. The uh, uh, How to Appreciate Motion Pictures gave rise to uh, uh, other, other activities on your part related to the critical analysis of the mass media. That's Did right. Not, is, well, we had a plan as soon as, uh, by the way, this textbook was uh, uh, made available it, it was and uh, Charters Dr. Charters always had the idea that you ought to nail something down not leave it halfway done mm -hmm. and so we conceived the idea of working with six state departments of education in terms of furnishing free materials and so on and having them try out these materials Are they all midwestern states or no they were Cal California oh. Pennsylvania and so on. Mm -hmm. And the general idea was you've got to get it into some kind of curriculum program. Mm -hmm. And I worked with those states, went there and worked with the schools, uh, and uh, they had the books available and I met with some of the classes and so on. And the general idea of charters was until that's in some kind of curriculum course of study, we haven't done our job. And we were able to do that, and we stimulated uh, the National Council of Teachers of English to carry on the motion picture work there at UC. And so they, they uh, put out certain materials. That was the general idea. This would be a sort of a seedbed of activity. That's a good point. And you found actually taking your materials to the students in the classroom to be a very important thing all the rest of your career. Didn't That's you? right. You, you like to get out into the classroom and That's work right. with the young people. Now, uh, next came, of course, a shift to other media, mm -hmm. uh, like the, the, the press. Mm -hmm. And so, at the, again, I did the same, almost a duplicate of it, uh, on how to read a newspaper. That's probably the most famous of the 
the things that you did in that area. Uh, why do you suppose uh, how to read a newspaper was uh, so kind of widely used and quoted uh, and uh, how to appreciate motion pictures uh, while probably every bit as important uh, didn't get quite as much notice. Well, we were doing things like reading a, reading a newspaper before, do you see? We were reading. Mm -hmm. And so this was an ad it involved no change in objectives. It didn't involve any change in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And so they could take material like this and easily move it ahead. And we had much more, I think there's been much more response from the press itself. They've been interested in teaching youngsters how to read a newspaper because they're interested in, that's their business. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, the National Publishers Association has a unit that deals directly with that. How do you read a newspaper? Well, how do you read it? <laughs> well, first of all, you, there are certain things you look for in, in the press. That is, the easy ones. That'll be the scores of baseball and basketball and so on. <laughs> It'll be the weather and so on. But uh, one of the things you do when you read a newspaper is to ask whether or not the news is presented in a balanced way. Mm -hmm. And that's a tough one. Uh, uh, People will say, well, the newspaper's all full of crime news and so on and so on. Well, sometimes it isn't, sometimes it isn't. Right. But uh, there's, there's some interesting uh, points that are made in that, and I'm now revising my, this newspaper book, making it all media. But the statement is made, if the, if the messenger brings bad news, don't shoot the messenger. Right. That, that seems like a good argument. but. You finally are faced with the fact that the publisher must present a balanced point of view. He, if he wanted to, he could find all good news right. or he could find all bad news. And he's got to have some balance. There have been some studies made by Gerbner and others which shows that when there's a lot of bad news been presented, people subsequently will think of people as bad. Hmm. And uh, if there's a lot of good news, People will believe that people are good. So that it does have an effect, again, just like the motion picture. Mm -hmm. And so we teach them, how, how do you evaluate the news? Well, it's the same thing as critical reading. Now we're getting a great deal of that. Mm -hmm. How do you tell whether this is a truthful statement? Not easy. Now, newspapers themselves, a few of them, the more enlightened ones, have now an ombudsman. Mm -hmm. They'd employed a man who analyzes the news in their paper and, and criticizes it, evaluates it. There's a man named Seib, S-E-I-B, who used to be with the Washington Star, and he's doing that now from the Washington Post. And I've been getting those articles, and they're tough-minded. Mm -hmm. He's been critical of the Washington Post at certain points. That's good. And uh, the only agreement he has with them is that, they, that he is to let them know ahead of time what he's going to publish. <laughs> so they have a chance to at least uh, get a chance to reply. Right. But that I think the, the, that whole spirit of the critical-minded, and we don't mean by that the unfavorable-minded, the, the do, uh, writing, reading and writing with a critique in mind, I think is, is, is progressing. That's, uh, I think, seen an interesting uh, resurgence just perhaps in the last uh, six months. Uh, it seemed like with uh, the scandals of the Nixon administration and other kinds of frustrations over uh, Vietnam War and so on, the journalists had turned largely to cynical kinds of yes. statements about things. But uh, more recently, we seem to be able to be critical, but not cynical. Uh, I think that's a good point. Uh, so a lot of things influence. Well, now you, we had the, the student problems in the oh, a few years ago at Ohio State and elsewhere. It didn't last very long here. But a part of that came out of Vietnam and so on, where the, the students were cynical about what was going on, and they were being lied to, right. not, so, uh, not so much by newspapers, I think. Well, uh, you know, if the newspaper quotes a government official lying to you, it's the government official's lies, not the newspaper's That's lies. Right. I mean, yeah. the, the reporter is still just reporting. Well, there's been a good deal of discussion among, among newspapers as to what they should do in a case like that. The, for instance, the Senator McCarthy reports mm -hmm. And should they report everything he said? And they use the argument, well, he said it, but that isn't good enough. They, they, they need to track up and see, track it up and see whether or not it's true. Hmm. Now, we've established in this country a newspaper council which aims to study news 
uh, from uh, an objective point of view. Mm -hmm. Some newspapers are for this and some are not. Mm -hmm. Now, it has worked well in Great Britain. But we, I think that's one of our great problems, the problems of the mass media. I was told the other day by a friend that increasingly the little chains are being bought up by the big chains. And this man, head of journalism department, was very worried about it. 97% mm -hmm. uh, of the cities in this country are not news one newspaper towns. Right. And in some cases, uh, the newspaper also owns a television station. So that's a critical problem we have ahead of us. We're, Who's to, uh, who's to watch the watchers? <laughs> right. Uh, back there uh, uh, in your uh, tenure in the Bureau of Educational Research and Service, uh, uh, you had a number of young, bright colleagues, uh, uh, not only uh, uh, Ralph Tyler, whom you've mentioned, but uh, his brother Keith came yes. here to Ohio State. Uh, there were uh, a number of others over the years. Uh, uh, just uh, the staff of the eight-year study seemed yes. to be an incredible concentration of talent. Uh, and I guess uh, I'm kind of curious as to uh, uh, your relationship to that eight-year study and those people and the kind of uh, atmosphere that was generated uh, uh, during that period of time, uh, Ralph Tyler headed up the eight years. Yes. Did you have any direct responsibility? None at all. No, no, I had very little connection with the eight year study. But you knew what was going on. Oh yes, and I knew a number of the people who were uh, engaged in it. That was one of the. Louis Rotz was one of the persons who was working on it. Who later went to New York University and now has retired. Hilda Taba was. Yeah, here. Hilda Taba. Uh, Golly, I, I can't think of too many more right now, but it, it, the, the, the list was mind-boggling. I think Ralph Tyler said once that uh, the advantage he had was that it was easy to find good talent during the Depression, but I yeah. think there was probably more to it than that. Well, what, did, what happened <laughs> finally, uh, by the way, I once asked, about six months ago, I asked Ralph Tyler in terms of his career, what did he think stood out, that was most fruitful and so on? He said the eight-year study. And what the eight-year study did was to loosen up the high school curriculum, mm -hmm. make it uh, uh, easier for persons who had had different curricula to get into college and so on. Basically, what, what it consisted of was the agreement of colleges to not count Carnegie units from That's certain right. yeah. experimental schools, right? That's right. And then those schools felt free to innovate or change their curriculum in various ways. I think the most striking conclusion was that the schools that had the most innovation had done the best in terms of schoolwork. The greater the innovation, the greater the productivity of the school. Mm -hmm. In terms of student success That's right. in the follow-up. They actually yeah. followed students yeah. through their college years, didn't they? By the way, I have a quotation from Ralph Tyler, which is not, not recent, but maybe six, seven, eight years ago in which he said that the productivity of the college could be doubled on the basis of what we already know how to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, maybe that's an underestimate, too. <laughs> you wonder sometimes. Yeah. Did, uh, can you tell us uh, about though that environment? That, that just must have been an exciting time, an exciting place to be in that Bureau of Educational Research and Service in the College of Education at Ohio State during uh, the 1930s? Well, first of all, you were doing the research that you wanted to do. You were not hemmed in. Mm -hmm. uh, Ralph, for example, was doing a lot of research in, with the various university uh, departments, making, helping them develop tests. Dr. Chatters and I helped to, to uh, sh uh, revise the curriculum of veterinary medicine. And uh, we were on hand to help schools in many different ways. It was easy to shift and uh, uh, into doing something not entirely new, but you weren't. And there was money available. We had research assistants. Did you have to write a big long proposal for every uh, project? We had to write a proposal where we indicated what the objectives were and what our due dates were going to be, and so on. 
And that took some time, but not in the sense that you have to do it today. Was most of the money just part of the regular state appropriations? That's right. Now, of course, the pain fund money, which was big money at that time, was, has about $300,000 or $350,000, which translated into dollars today was a considerably considerable sum. Right. But, uh, but those were the exceptions, and most of the other kinds of things yes. were... Uh, just part of the regular way of doing business in the That's university. Right. Now we also had another thing that's not uh, not so easily available to the young man today, and that is we had the Educational Research Bulletin, mm -hmm. and uh, that uh, uh, would uh, sometimes uh, be used for the art uh, reporting the research, mm -hmm. and we also had the Journal of Higher Education, which, where that was also possible. Mm -hmm. So that. The objectives uh, were not only to do the research, but to share that research. Right. And there was a vehicle for accomplishing both the doing and the sharing. Well, the, and the, here's another illustration. The money was coming in from different uh, projects that were financed. I did a project in connection with the National Tuberculosis Association. And Dr. Mm -hmm. Charters was also working with them on that same thing. And so he applied certain of his techniques to their publication activities, and they decided that they wanted to revise their popular pamphlets. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were not readable. And so I was asked to revise those pamphlets, and I had research assistants, as many students, as many professors do not have today. And so I revised, I take a pamphlet, and put it into a language that would be easily understood. I was, I was working on vocabulary at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would be tested out. Uh, and uh, we, we had developed studies of the vocabulary known by adults. And we found uh, by applying a readability formula, uh, one of the earlier ones, not my own, we hadn't mm -hmm. developed it yet, we found that most of the materials were at about the 11th or 12th grade. Mm -hmm. But the people who got tuberculosis were the poor people, the crowded right. people and so on. Right. And so we, we revised most of those pamphlets to, to be at the 7th or 8th grade level. Uh -huh. You mentioned that uh, you had research assistants at that time. Yes. Uh, graduate students, uh, were you the advisor for them typically? Yes, you would typically be. Not always, mm -hmm. but nearly always, you would be their advisor as well. And uh, they would be assigned project by project, or would they be sort of assigned to you? They'd be assigned to you. For example, Louis Rotz was my uh, uh, research assistant, but he did his doctorate under Ralph Tyler. Mm -hmm. But he was just assigned to you. You, yes, you didn't he have helped to. Me. He helped me on, uh, for instance, this content analysis that I spoke about earlier. He did mm -hmm. a lot of the building up of the structure for the analysis and so on. Right. And uh, uh, when a particular project was done, then you and the graduate assistants turned to the next one. That's right. Uh, that's a. Of course, a tremendous advantage, especially if you get bright people, because they, they are so flexible that they can handle different kinds of tasks. Right. And you don't have that start up and wind down kind of time that we get so much of nowadays. That's right. uh, because your staff was there and you could count on them. You knew to trust them to do certain kinds of things. That's right. Now, all of them are able in writing as well. Many of them have published afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, how long were you here before Keith Tyler came? I think he's uh, about five years. About five years. Uh, and he was interested, even at that time, in educational broadcasting, was he not? Yes, I think so. I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, he so was a curriculum specialist, and uh, mm -hmm. I don't know that he had as a direct, deep concern yet or not. But, but in a sense, you, you had maybe your first kindred spirit on the staff that was concerned about audio audiovisual things, or were there some actually, others? Well, actually, I had visited mm -hmm. him in connection with my work one time when he was out at Oakland. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he was associate superintendent for curriculum or something? Yes, there. he was in the field of the curriculum out there. Mm -hmm. So you, you knew him before. Uh, how, how did this uh, 
Dale Tyler uh, media empire kind of uh, evolved. I was the first director of the uh, radio, called the Radio Institute then, and uh, I did that for two years, and then it was taken over by a young PhD specialist, and then this man lost his life in a park, a mountain climbing, and then Keith came on after that. Uh-huh. And that so, became that Institute for Education by Radio and Television. Yes. Uh, you you actually started that. Well, no, no, I, I oh, was secretary the, of it. Okay. The, for the very first one and the second one. By the way, the first one we ran for 10 days. Wow. Uh, right here in Columbus? Right here in Columbus. Yeah, they, they, what, the stories about those conferences fascinate me how uh, people seem to make a pilgrimage to Columbus that's right. it was, uh, was the first really uh, professionally oriented uh, uh, academy if you will that's right actually a number of those names if you see the records see the book the yearbooks were the were the distinguished people in the field and then as then uh, what happened was uh, the need became greater than we were able to furnish and so other people organized other organ uh, other groups, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, when did uh, the Ohio State Awards come into being in relation to that? Well, I'm not quite sure, but it was not. We didn't get them initially. I think that Keith started the awards. Started the the awards program. Um, did you and Keith ever do any uh, research that? Uh, where you both were working on a, a media-related project in those early years, or no? I don't think so. Those those projects came. Of course, he was late. seeing what I had written, and I saw many things that he did as well. So we were sitting right next to each other in offices and so on. So mm -hmm. this was a great advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, the Institute for Education, or uh, the Radio Institute, yeah, uh, was concerned about. Just school broadcast, or was it concerned about any kind of radio that might have educational? Well, it was concerned about any kind of radio that might have uh, have uh, educational value. But of course, we were getting a large number of these managers of the stations of the the educational stations. You see, so they mm -hmm. formed a kind of a nucleus. And there was a kind of a little feeling against the commercial people. They thought so anyway. I didn't feel that way, and neither, I'm sure, did Keith. But uh, Basically, our focus was on the educational value of these materials, and we did have the attendance of the key uh, radio educational stations. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I suppose in, in those days, Wisconsin had already developed an elaborate uh, radio network. Yeah, that's and, right. And, uh, uh, who were some, uh, where were some of the other major uh, radio, uh, educational radio operations. Big city school systems, were they in? Well, yes, the big city school systems. Rochester was an example. Cleveland was another one. And many of those, they again, in all of these things, you have the nurture of leaders. Mm -hmm. And you had uh, key people coming out of Cleveland. You had key people coming out of Rochester and other places like that. Mm -hmm. And we had certain cities where they were using radio. And so these people would be reporting. Would they report formal research uh, that we're engaged in? Well, largely the kind of the curriculum, but uh, in some cases there would be the research of the pre-testing and the post-testing. There's been a great deal of that to show, well, after all, they are learning and so on. Did, uh, uh, what was your reaction to that kind of research where uh, people seem to have to prove over and over again that um, people do learn from radio or people do learn from film or later people do learn from television and whatever else. Uh, did, did you, uh, you didn't do very much of that. Uh, did you find it to be kind of uh, beating a dead horse? Were you sure they already learned and you thought we ought to go beyond that or? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, you, we still have that same thing with reading. Mm -hmm. And uh, it always bothers me because anybody knows that we learn from these things. There's no issue about that. I mean, uh, but the researchers it, seem to act like there's an issue, don't they? They, they wonder whether you. Uh, I guess it's whether you learn more from one yes. or the other, maybe. But uh, well, we had a lot of that argument in the very beginning, and uh, the answer, of course, is that we, what we're concerned about is a combination of these media. Mm 
we're not assuming that we're going to educate merely by radio or merely by television or merely by reading books. Mm -hmm. And that idea wasn't isn't new, right? Uh, it, that's been around for 30 years at least. Yes, well, I suppose that in any field, uh, you, to be respectable, you have to have a certain kind of research. Uh, for example, there was this one, this, you've heard this, the proverb, allegedly Chinese, that one picture is worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, that statement was, is not Chinese. It was made by a man named Jamison Handy, who was a motion picture producer. Right. And he had the idea, and he thought, well, who would listen to Jamison Handy when you could quote it as a Chinese proverb? <laughs> but that, 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 that was the kind of argument you're getting. One picture is worth a thousand words, and you can easily just easily say that one word is worth a thousand pictures mm -hmm. of the right time, circumstance, and so on. Mm -hmm. So. There was uh, the almost the implication there was sort of an antagonism between the media, mm -hmm. and uh, the sensible thing to say is that all make some kind of combination uh, contribution. What we're trying to do is to find out how to combine them, how to mm -hmm. f most fruitfully combine them. This seemed to move you, at least, uh, I guess, in in the direction of what became the audiovisual methods of teaching books. Uh, through three editions, and in that, the cone of experience. Yes. Not, uh, uh, the, the, the cone of experience was intended to be kind of an integrating notion. That's right. It was intended to take the idea of concrete to abstract. We always say, well, teach, move from the concrete to the abstract, kind of a platitude and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, we didn't follow it out. We, our textbooks have often been very abstract. Mm -hmm. and then you ask, what is the route that you can travel moving from concrete to abstract? And that's what I try to do with the cone of experience. Mm -hmm. And I also tried to uh, negate the idea that you sort of move from concrete to abstract and that's the end of it. But what I was saying also was you move from the concrete to the abstract. Learning the abstract enables you to become much, have greater depth of concrete experience. Mm -hmm. As, for example, you would apply a certain chemistry formula and get greater information on that, like, like splitting of the atom. Mm -hmm. uh, it becomes concrete with an explosion. And uh, so what I tried to do in the cone was to show that, and here's a very rich experience, the, the, what we call the bottom of the cone. And that's, that's basic. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, any, any kind of thinking about learning means you do go back to sense experiences. But no sense experience is entirely a sense experience. It gets labels of various sorts. It gets names. Mm -hmm. And so then as you move up the cone, you ab abstract more. Mm -hmm. You're taking, you change time sequences. Mm -hmm. You no longer have to show a person an apple when you're talking about an apple. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you have dramatized the experience. There you're taking out the time factor mm -hmm. and you're putting in some other interesting things. You have models, you have exhibits, mm -hmm. you have study trips, mm -hmm. and uh, there, there are, and you move up to the pinnacle of the cone, and you have a sign, a symbol of some sort, a mm -hmm. formula, a word. But then you can, then you take that word, and you realize that there are rich experiences that are behind it. And William James once said, "You can't see any farther into a generalization." then your knowledge of its details extends. Right, right. And uh, I, I think that I have two motives there. One is I, I certainly want to see that youngsters get lots of rich experiences, and we know something mm -hmm. about that. And I also want to see that those rich experiences are generalized so that they're made transferable. You're not right. trapped in the concrete. You don't get, don't right. get stuck in the concrete. The uh, other kind of dimension of the cone, which uh, seems to me to have been a long-term struggle for you, was to convince people that the relationship among all the various media in that cone was a relativistic relationship right. rather than an absolute one. That's right. But it's curious, I kept, uh, people would be saying, well, you always start with the concrete. You don't always start with the concrete. Then you move up the cone in this, in, uh, with, as though those steps were something were absolute. Mm -hmm. They're all interrelated. Right. Uh, at, at some point, some language 
is as concrete for somebody as you're going to get That's because right. they've already had a number of other experiences. Right. So that language in itself is not for an individual an abstraction. That's right. It may be very concrete for him. And, 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 as, and when it gets to that stage, it becomes an extremely powerful thing. That's right. Enormously powerful. I don't think we realize how powerful it is that we have words that have rich backgrounds behind them. And I, I think constantly about that transfer mm -hmm. and application. We now will have persons read, but you leave out that last step, that is to interpret and to apply it. How do you apply this knowledge? Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, eminent logic of the cone, uh, of course, has had a lot of contemporary uh, uh, utilization uh, in, in terms of compensatory programs for the so-called culturally deprived or the yes. kinds of things we say we have to provide them a lot of concrete experience. That's right. uh, we've we've had a lot of uh, emphasis uh, on uh, active learning, participatory learning, and so on. Uh, uh, but again, people don't seem to want to, to, to move up the cone either. You're, you're talking just now about moving back down, but they don't seem to want to move up from there to the more generalizable experience. Well, that's, that, I think that's a bit the, sort of a basic issue in education. How do you avoid uh, starting with the abstract where there are no details, no concreteness, and how do you avoid uh, staying in that concrete level? Look, it's a kind of a, it's a lot, some of it became a lot of busy work. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm If you just, if you stay in any one of those levels yeah. too long, it's liable to be busy work. That's right. right. The, it, at, in the symbolic domain, it just becomes rote memory without very much That's meaning. That's right. And in the concrete, uh, you seem to be easily bogged down in uh, very routine that's kinds right. of matters. Well, there's got to be an element of unpredictability, I think, in all of these experiences. And then when, when somebody prescribes for you, the learner, with the implication they, they can predict what you need and so on, it's partly true and it's partly false. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the word flexible helps us here. We want a, we want a flexible learner. A person can, and uh, just, he might be able to write. He could write mm -hmm. with certain skill. He could be able to uh, speak and uh, and prepare materials, and he ought to have some maybe some photographic or some other kind of experience so that he's uh, uh, ambidextrous, mm -hmm. visually, audio, visually ambidextrous. Right. Uh, the, it, it would seem uh, that in an age so filled with a, a bombardment of, of media messages that uh, certainly learners ought to be able to communicate on a, on a richer basis than just simply writing or speaking. Yes, right. That's right. Well, the, the people in the field of English are partly responsible for the idea that there are two things in terms of communication, reading and writing and speaking and listening. But they leave off something that, they, uh, that we're seeing right in this room, the, the idea of visualizing something and learning to observe. Here, here's a, here are pictures here, do you see? And yet uh, that fourfold reading, writing, speaking, listening seems to cover at least verbally mm -hmm. what the English teacher is concerned with. Mm -hmm. And yet mm -hmm. they are now using films a great deal and they're using pictorial materials and so on. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure whether they are respectable yet. When did the uh, uh, first uh, edition of audiovisual and methods in teaching uh, get published? I think it was 1948. 1948. And the yeah. next one came about 54, and the last one came at 69. Right. Did, uh, did you actually uh, start working on these ideas in the 30s, or uh, was it pretty much a product of uh, your experience through World War II and the like? Uh, can you can you estimate that? I you know I suppose that's pretty hard to say where something really began in in a career. Well, of course, I was impressed with the with the pain fund studies of the role of the uh, audio visual experience, mm -hmm. and 
I wrote uh, How to Appreciate Motion Pictures, which of course dealt with that. Mm -hmm. And then I'd had some familiarity with uh, some of the really extensive slide programs, the glass slides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I just, I think writing a few articles, but I'm not quite certain. Uh, I just sort of moved into it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is probably what happens with, with a lot of our ideas. There's no really fixed beginning date. Uh, in fact, if we could assign a date to it, it probably wouldn't be a real date. That's right. Uh, when did the newsletter come into being? Well, the newsletter came into being as a part of this whole business of keeping in touch with these persons who had uh, been interested in uh, how to appreciate motion pictures. Mm -hmm. And we were then coming into the whole area of radio. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, television hadn't reached much prominence at that time. And so these things came on gradually, I would say. But it was a follow-up to the pain fund. That's right. Again, we, we see we'd had a number of people working with us in those states. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wanted some way to keep them up with the news and also to prepare certain essays and so on, dealing with the media. Mm -hmm. And so the pain fund uh, agreed to publish it. And so we did, a, I think, a rather unique thing. We had an essay in each issue and also 10 or 12 or 13 or 14 news items. Mm -hmm. Some of them were quotations and so on. Some were reviews of material. Yes, that's right. So, so it, it acted as a kind of a liaison agency for persons concerned with uh, teaching discrimination and other things in reference to the mass media. It had a circulation of about how many copies? When we finished, we were sending it to 26,000 people. And all those people really had to do was to uh, pay the cost of an addressograph plate? They had to pay nothing. Just write they, a letter. They, just write a letter. They didn't we we couldn't to. afford to charge for it. That <laughs> seems like an anomalous thing to say, but when you do the bookkeeping and everything else, it was really a, a, an inexpensive operation. And it was aimed at the person who was concerned with communication. Mm -hmm. Now, there are others who did it now. Pain Fund sent me one summer and Mrs. Dale to Europe and uh, Turkey, Greece, mm -hmm. Turkey, Asia Minor, to locate the key television uh, and the, the communication specialists. Mm -hmm. And I did that in these various, about 17 countries. And so we put them on, our, got in touch with them and put them on the newsletter mailing list and so on. Mm -hmm. So we had a kind of a network of uh, understanding with a lot of people in a lot of different countries. Mm -hmm. And then the newsletter was also reproduced by many magazines and so on. So almost you could almost uh, predict that any issue would appear so that 100,000, uh, you'd have about 100,000 circulation. So not only was it a good follow-up, but it had a multiplier effect. That's right, say. yeah. And that's a key term, a multiplier effect. We don't use it often enough. You want to have... Uh, impinge on the situation so you don't have to do all the work, that That's you right. do a piece of it yeah. and some other people carry the torch uh, to the next uh, stage. Uh, and then we uh, we did a book on some of the essays, Can You Give the Public What It Wants? And, and a publisher wrote me the other day wanting to know whether I had material like that it might be available for another book, a paperback. You you wrote a lot of essays. Uh, how many issues a year did that typically a newsletter typically have it had it had eight times thirty six about two hundred fifty essays some of them I repeated once in a while uh, and you occasionally would have a guest essayist not often not often that's right. once in a while Robert Wagner wrote one mm -hmm. in the beginning we had uh, two or three guest authors but <laughs> you were the you were the essayist uh, yeah. uh, for that the uh, time of World War II was certainly a traumatic time in the That's whole right. culture of the United States. I think people who really grew up after World War II can't appreciate the, the tremendous effort that went into dealing with that war, uh, the cessation of the production of consumer goods altogether. Yes. Uh, no refrigerators, no automobiles, etc. cetera. Uh, the whole economic production system of the country turned to um, production of military goods 
women taking jobs as welders and riveters uh, while their husbands were overseas and so on. And of course the academic community had to turn its talents to what I guess you'd call the, the war effort. That's right. Uh, very uh, different kind of situation than pertained during Korea or Vietnam or the like. I think uh, in Vietnam we really did try to have guns and butter and perhaps have suffered uh, yeah. economically since then. Um, what happened to you uh, in, in World War II? Well, uh, after we'd been in the war just a relatively short time, I got a letter from Arch Mercy. And uh, it was on the uh, president's stationery and it looked very imposing. And he asked me to, uh, whether I would like to come down there and work with him on, in the quotes of the war effort. And I agreed that I did, and so I spent a couple of years down there. In Washington? In Washington, a year and a half, I think it was. What By was... that time, the outcome of the war was becoming pretty clear, and we had done about the job that we had tried to do. Mm -hmm. Of course, one of the things that, that happened was that there were a lot of models from World War I. Mm -hmm. There were films made in World War I, some very good ones. You had that uh, the problem that you mentioned of creating talented people who could uh, develop materials of instruction for that huge number that went into the armed forces. Mm -hmm. It was training from scratch. There really was no standing army yes. at all. And then, then there were, uh, of course, uh, there was the Office of Price Administration, OPA. I was loaned to them for a while. I worked with them. That was to develop materials for what the people. Uh, that the, some of those materials were to were to inform people about the the shift and change in off uh, of uh, prices and the points that are needed to buy things and so on. You see, mm -hmm. the rationing program and that's right. All those those matters. So your, your work was primarily in the design of materials. That's right. Uh, did you take Bob Wagner uh, with you then? or, or He came shortly after that. Had you known him before? Yes, or? he was my student here at Ohio State. Mm -hmm. And did he work with you directly? On no, that? he worked uh, mostly uh, with other persons on the, on the production side. I was not the producer. I was sort of an idea person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he worked up in New York City most of the time, quite a mm -hmm. good deal of the time. And then after that war, after the war was over as a part of it, he was in South America producing films with with key people. Mm -hmm. uh, was most of the production effort directed into the motion picture or, uh, medium? Or no. Well, there, there, there was a, uh, my boss, Arch Mercy, was chairman of a committee for uh, the Office of War Information. Mm -hmm. And he met with people in the magazine field, the newspaper field, the radio field, the television field, and so on. And a series of messages were prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to say this about OPA, and we're going to say this about this, and so on. And so the magazines, of course, had a lag of two or three months. Right. But the press were immediate. And then a member of our staff was in, in, in uh, Hollywood trying to get them to help work on the war effort. Mm -hmm. And so we had, in a sense, a union, a loose, flexible union of the various media with the, the messages pretty clear cut as to what we were going to develop. Mm -hmm. And I know there was quite a flurry when the, oh, the OPA came along and we were on that. Mm -hmm. the, did, did any of these things get evaluated formally or, or was it just a question of just trying to do everything you could do under the pressures of that? very intense time. Well, there were people evaluating it, but not in any narrow sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The critical thing was where we went in the war and yeah. uh, where we getting the goods to the people that needed them That's and so right. on. In other words, a plan was worked out in terms of producing uh, films for, for teaching persons how to do certain kinds of technical activities. And that was mm -hmm. accepted and there'd be one right after the other. There'd be a techniques developed for it. And they didn't waste any time producing the stuff either, did no. they? They had to get it out because uh, time was of the essence. I uh, mentioned before that the first edition of the Audiovisual Methods of Teaching came out in 1948. You would have been back here at Ohio State how long? Uh, 
by the well, time I came we, well, I came back here before the war was over, actually. But I, one of the things I did was to produce a film in Hollywood mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, how to teach flexible gunnery. That's the title of it. That's mm -hmm. for the Air Force. So I spent some time out there. Mm -hmm. But I came back here before the war was over. Mm -hmm. We were then preparing material in terms of uh, uh, when when uh, Japan is defeated. We were the, the, at the tail end of our activities. We were assuming they were winning the war, mm -hmm. and we're thinking about peace activities. Mm -hmm. Transition to transition. To peace. Yes, and, uh, and of course, when you returned to Ohio State, you had to think about the influx of uh, uh, all manner of. Uh, men who had been serving in the armed forces. Was, was that anticipated? The no, I was just going to say it was not anticipated as far as I know. I don't mean there was no knowledge of it, of course, but the influx was extremely great, the, the GI Bill and so on. Now, for mm -hmm. example, uh, Dr. O'Rourke, my associate, he was uh, uh, in the Air Force, mm -hmm. and uh, he had not gone to college, and he went to, did his college work after the war. Well, and he would not have been able to go otherwise. I think uh, that GI Bill had, has had more impact on uh, scholarship and, and leadership in the United States than we'll probably ever know, uh, don't you, you I'm think? sure that's true. But the difficulty is we always have to have a crisis to get us to do the things we ought to do without <laughs> the crisis. I don't know if there's any remedy for that or not. All the way through, your career related to audiovisual communications, media, the mass media, whatever term. Uh, you've tried to see the media as interrelated. Yes. As uh, a rich array of opportunities for providing experience of one sort or another. Uh, and uh, so Never in, in the process of, of this have you turned away from language and print and the like, right? That's right. You had the How to Read a Newspaper in the 30s. You had uh, a variety of, of work during World War II with not just film, but uh, newspapers, magazines, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, following World War II, Kind of, this all came to kind of a head uh, at the time you had a student named Jean Chaw. Yeah, it? right. What, when did she come to you as a student? Oh, well, it's a long ago. I've forgotten when, but but maybe 25 years ago by now. Mm -hmm. yeah. 22, 23, something like that. How, how did she find you particularly? Had well, now here's an, or... an, an illustration of what you can do if you're a professor. Uh, her professor, Irving Lorge, and he, by the way, she was his secretary for a while, hmm. and she started taking some work. And he said, well, what you ought to do, she's Jewish. And he said, you ought to go out, uh, leave New York City and get into a different kind of environment, a wholly different kind of environment. Mm -hmm. And she said, where? And he said, why don't you go out to Ohio State University and take work with Edgar Dale? In other words, a, sh a shift now in her environment. Mm -hmm. So she did that. And then we had the funds then for the health materials, and uh, I don't know how we got into the idea of a, read oh, yes, I do know, a readability formula. Uh, Carlton Washburn had developed one. Mm -hmm. And there had been various attempts of that sort. And Ralph Tyler and I had worked on one. Mm -hmm. And this had been reported. And so she came here to study. And uh, she's gifted in a lot of different ways. And decided that, uh, one of the things we decided was that we would try to develop a readability formula, especially with the health materials. We had already analyzed the health materials using the flesh formula. Mm -hmm. And uh, so sort of one thing leads to another. If you have a research session, you have to do a lot of talking together. And uh, she said that the first day that she came here, I handed her some materials and, he, and I said to her, well, I'd like to have your judgment on this. She said, judgment, he doesn't want my judgment, that's just a ploy, kind of, you know, the professors say that. <laughs> but she said, I discovered you did want my judgment on it. And I think that's kind of a clue in terms of what you can do with a research assistant. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing led to another, and then we began formulating. I had been working on simple vocabulary, mm 
and we began, and there, it was known then that there were two big factors in readability. One was the vocabulary itself. Mm -hmm. The other one was the sentence structure. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, took uh, certain test materials, in which there already were scores on the materials, and uh, began playing around with the formula. And finally, we developed the one that we had. And uh, mm -hmm. her dissertation, by the way, was not the readability formula, because mm. that was completed oh. as a, <clears throat> and, and published. But also, uh, she made a study of to what extent is that getting into use by mm. business and other uh, uh, places. So we had the follow-up then, and we discovered it was being widely used. I guess it, in general, uh, people would assert that that is still the most precise and complete kind of formula for determining readability. Uh, would you agree with that? Well, I could hardly disagree with it, but <laughs> the, uh, the search evidence points along that line, too. It's very widely used still. Some say it's a little more complicated to apply than some of the more simplified formulas. Well, it actually isn't. I mean, we can do a formula in about 15 minutes on a 100-word sample. And how many hundred-word samples do you like to well, take out of it? Well, it all word? depends on the kind of material. You have to watch out that you don't uh, get it too, to, you have it spread. But you've got to look at the material, too, because you have realize that uh, in the beginning you're going to have more hard words, perhaps, mm -hmm. than you are at the end. But that has not been very well regulated, I think. I think that we haven't yet learned the lessons of writing for readability. Mm -hmm. The... Uh, <clears throat> Perhaps the biggest application of the readability work that uh, you and Dr. Chawl uh, engaged in uh, has been in, in the commercial publishing field, has it not? Yes, but even, uh, even there I've been somewhat disappointed. To, uh, years ago, the uh, various publications, the weekly publications, my weekly reader and so on, they had a very perceptive editor. And this woman took one of my early word lists, the 3,000 word lists, mm -hmm. and she more or less assigned in the great material of the writing that they could use a certain number of words. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they went beyond that, uh, then they had to uh, give a reason for it. In other words, they had really graded their material on the basis of some of this vocabulary material I had done. And, now, and, uh, and then instead of having to apply a formula after something was written, they tried to get the authors to write within certain kinds of structures right. that would produce readable material. That's right. Uh, the same kind of thing happened with the World Book, did it not? Yes. I was asked to join the staff of the World Book Encyclopedia 25 years ago this year. Mm. And uh, they then wanted two kinds of analyses. They wanted to, well, to know whether their photographs were okay. And so we took the A volume, and uh, I had some helpers, and we analyzed the, every single photograph in that A volume. Found the criticism, the, made a critique of it. Once you'd, you'd realize, A, the picture is not large enough. B, you're asking, you're assuming that there's certain material in that picture, but it's not sharply defined enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we raised another question about the placement of the photographs. Mm -hmm. And we found that if you place the photograph on either the page that the article des described it, or on the opposite page, you'd get an interaction. Look at the photograph, read, read, look at the photograph. But if you, if you put it on the next page, and you had to turn over and turn back, they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the results of that, we made the photographs larger and the, the color mm -hmm. seemed to reproduce more detail. Mm -hmm. but. We, every picture that was in there, every photograph, we raised the question of, is it clear? Is it doing the job that it should do? Mm -hmm. And they also carried on a research on regard to maps mm -hmm. and found out what I think many thoughtful people would, would predict, that it's too detailed, you can't get the idea quickly and so on, it's too small and so on. Mm -hmm. So there was a research base for a good deal of the work that I did. and. Uh, one of the things we did in the early days was to actually give tests, test the materials, on multiple choice tests of various materials. <coughs> we no longer do that. Now we get the galleys of the long articles, and Dr. O'Rourke 
is in charge of this. He's paid by them. And uh, we have, I read them, he reads them. We have six or seven teachers in Columbus who become very sophisticated about readability, who read them mm -hmm. and make their judgments on it. And they have, will have five or six of their students read them and give their judgments on it. So Dr. O'Rourke takes that, all that material and writes about a 30 or more page report on that particular galley. You, uh, Casey, would take an article out into the schools and, and try it out, so to speak, on the learners. Do you still yes, do some of that? Well, that's what we do with the galleys. You do that with the galleys? Yes. So sometimes you try it on more than five or six learners. You try it on a whole well, group? Well, it would be five or six in a class. Uh-huh. And you see whether, what, do you see just whether they can learn the content, or do you see whether they we like it? We get their it? reactions. All their reactions. Well, all their, their, for example, mm -hmm. It's not that detailed, but for example, we know we've got an excellent article when a lot of them are saying, I never knew that before. Mm -hmm. And that comes fairly often. And regardless of what you would call any kind of a readability score, if they're saying, I didn't know that before, and I was surprised and so on, mm -hmm. uh, we know we've got a good article. And there's a factor of length comes in too. They, they keep saying it was just about the right length. <laughs> I don't know how you translate that to what we do in college, but. Maybe the lectures are too long or so on, but it's just about the right length, mm -hmm. and that's important. And sometimes it's too long for one reading. And uh, the, uh, the, the words, some of them were hard, but the way they wrote about them, I understood the words. And so we will get an analysis of that sort. Now they have copies, they, they helped me develop the, this word list that Joseph O'Rourke and I have done, Living Word Vocabulary, and I had started that before then. And so their editors must look up the word if it looks hard, and if it's one that they is unimportant, they may take it out. But if it's an important hard word, then they define it in covert and overt ways, mm -hmm. so that the kid will read it and he will not realize that the word is being defined for him very skillfully by the author of that, by the editor of that article. What got you started on the big vocabulary study? Do you have 80,000? We know we have scores on 43,000 words. 43,000 words. It's so big I can't even deal with the size of it. Uh, well, the typical frequency study of vocabulary, Thorndike and others, emphasized only the spelling of the word. So you'd have a word like bar, B-A-R, and you'd have its frequency. But that grouped together a lot of words which were different in meaning. Mm -hmm. Sandbar, bar to, uh, crowbar, and so on. Now, we have made a, what we would call a semantic analysis of these words and have selected the key meanings of these words that have very many meanings, and uh, I think we've done a pretty good job of it. One of the ones uh, uh, that seems to uh, uh, illustrate some of that is, is deer, yeah. uh, uh, spelled D-E-A-R, yes. meaning friendship. Uh, or fondness would, would be a relatively simple word, right? That's right. Meaning expensive. I was surprised. I, we always, I always thought that the vocabulary of a deer would be in the typical vocabulary, but it's, it's, it's a little on the hard side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would that have been your experience as a child? Uh, it happened. I had a teacher who uh, liked to use deer as an ex expression of expensive along about the second or third grade so I learned that one early <laughs> but I, uh, I think you're right that the the scores would tend to show it to be a difficult word uh, so the, in the, these 43,000 yes just words. like a dictionary but just as though you had a dictionary with the words defined tersely and I think uh, quite well and a score we might say six 72. In other words, 72 percent of the kids at the sixth grade will know this word. Okay, so it, the six tells the grade level, yeah. and then the next number is the percentage of kids at that grade right. level who will know that word. Now, we did this with the three-choice multiple-choice test, which experts say is probably is the most fruitful one of the ways to test. But uh, we uh, had, of course, the, the two distractors. And we would find, of course, sometimes that the distractor either failed to distract or it over-distracted. So when those returns came in, we looked over every single one of those words mm -hmm. to be sure, and we retested again and again on certain words. Where did all this testing take place? 
all over the United States. We sampled the United States schools. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, uh, began to happen to you uh, pretty early on uh, was that students came to you here at Ohio State from all over the world. Uh, was one of the first ones uh, Dr. Nishimoto, or, or had there been no, a number No, he was before? not a student of mine. He oh, was he wasn't? A, he was not. He, he got his P, uh, doctor's degree at uh, Columbia, and I, oh. I met him on, my, on a trip to Japan. He was my interpreter oh. on a trip that I made there. I see. Well, can you tell some about those uh, students who were actually students of yours? I guess I was very mistaken about Nishimoto. He's become yeah. very associated with your name and so on uh, over the years? Well, some of them have gone back to their countries and some of them have stayed. Some of them have gone and come back. Don't find They haven't found opportunities to use their talents. Mm -hmm. But they, uh, one of them uh, who uh, well, uh, went back to Egypt, came back to this country and so on. But they've been movers and shakers in their own countries. And it seemed like after you'd have one of these students, uh, uh, you'd eventually end up following up that uh, student-professor relationship with a working visit to the country. I've done that, yes. Where all uh, have you have you had to go? Uh, well, I've gone to Israel. I've gone to to uh, Germany. I've gone to England. More, many of the European countries. You did some kind of project, was it in Jamaica? Or, uh... Yes, uh, I worked with Jamaica uh, on their first literacy program. Mm. And uh, I went down there and visited the various uh, places where this work was going on and so on. We've not done well in literacy throughout the world. There's, some, there's some basic defect in it. I'm not quite clear what it is, whether we, it's hard to get the motivation of adults or whatever it may be, but uh, there are more literates, illiterates in the world today than there were 10, 15 years ago. It is increasing. That's in part because the population is increasing. Right. But we haven't got a very good formula. Probably right. Uh, you did some work in Brazil. Well, I went to Brazil to work at the university, the research university down there, agricultural research. And what I did down there was to help them get a good description of what they were now teaching. That was a technique that charters had used here and I had used here. Mm -hmm. And I spent uh, six weeks down there dealing directly with uh, uh, getting persons to write down what they were actually doing, what they were actually teaching. Mm -hmm. And then they said, when I first got there, they said, well, we already have a syllabus. But when you look at these syllabi, you realize that uh, many of them are just meaningless. They're not down at the level where a person is actually going to teach something. Right, right. In the fact, general rule was that if you if you're going to take an hour's time on it, put it down. The interesting thing is, of course, uh, students kind of know that a syllabus doesn't tell too much, so they don't save those typically. The thing they save if they can get it is the test, right? Yeah. That, that seems to be more uh, meaningful. You uh, have made. What, two visits to Japan? Yes, two visits to Japan. And the textbook has been translated into yes, Japanese. Yes, and, it has. And Spanish and some Arab other. Arabic. Arabic. Uh, at least one of those trips to Japan, uh, you were, uh, you gave the, what was it, the, the Japan Prize speech uh, or lecture or whatever. Uh, well, I don't understand much about that. Could you? Well. The NHK, which is the, the Japanese Broadcasting Corporation, uh, had a uh, student here who studied with Keith. And so Keith is always, he'll tell you about that in his discussion on this topic. What we did there was to, uh, I visited all the, uh, uh, that, that's, that's the first visit, I visited all, all the five islands with Nishimoto, whom we've mentioned mm -hmm. before, mm -hmm. and, and met with the station managers of NHK, and also talked in all of these places and had a chance to visit schools. Mm -hmm. Now, the second visit was for the Japan Prize, and uh, I went there as a judge and, and uh, gave a talk to them at the end of the meetings. Now, those people are assembled. It's a Japan Prize for radio and television and so on. 
and those people come there from all over the world. It's a very right. prestigious uh, award. Right, it, it reviews film and, and television both. Right? Yes. Now, one result of these various visits is people start writing to you. Mm -hmm. And I have a letter on my desk right now in which a man has made a study of the words most frequently used by adults. And I have sent to him a study made on this campus of the words used by adults in telephone conversation. These are men, young naval cadets and so on. Mm -hmm. And so you set up a, it gets a little burdensome, I find them. <laughs> I have more of those contacts and I really have time to answer, but it's been an opportunity to put stuff into their hands. Mm -hmm. You've been fortunate to have a very good secretary uh, to help you with that. That's right. That's another factor. We don't say very much about it in research, but very often the, the, the bright secretary, like Miss, uh, Miss Chapin, they're, they're really research workers, really, and, and right. not just partly, but really. Yeah, you can send her off to the library to That's get right. some things and the like. Uh, it's a very, I've been jealous of, of that kind of <laughs> service for, for some time. It's a thing we typically don't get these days. Uh, we've talked about a, a wide range of, of things uh, in a career that's uh, spanned well over 40 years. I guess you were actually, uh, before you were you so-called retired. At I Ohio started State. teaching in 1918. I was. Uh, I just turned 18. I was 17 when I got the opportunity to teach. So in the teaching profession since 1918, yeah. uh, next year that would be a 60-year teaching career. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, what do you think is the most important thing that that you've done in the course of all the many things, many varied things? Well, somehow or other, I early got the concept that there's a lot of rich knowledge available. And that's, we ought to have some techniques for get, moving that rich knowledge into the minds and hearts of people. Mm -hmm. And so I became, I didn't use the word then, I got the word from charters of communication. And so it's the sharing of ideas and feelings in a mood of mutuality. Here's all this information, the librarians want to share it, and teachers want to share it. But it isn't available, it isn't packaged right, it isn't written right, it isn't pictured right, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so I think that whole idea of improving the quality of the communication so that everybody could have access to excellence. And that's mm -hmm. a kind of a lodestar, access to excellence. And then the amount of excellence that's available is enormous. Mm -hmm. And you need some middlemen mm -hmm. and women to share that. I think that whole idea and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, also the whole idea of varieties of experience at different levels and the ability to diagnose what persons need and have them make self-diagnoses. Mm -hmm. But I think that, uh, that uh, of course I think of the motivation factor in all of these things, but that whole idea of taking the excellent ideas and translating them into a form that can be understood by a first grader or a tenth grader or a college graduate and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, that certainly is a thing that we we're going to need to be doing for a long time, isn't it? That's, That's right. a, a, a labor that, uh, while you've, you've certainly made a, a number of important impacts, uh, we're all going to have to <laughs> deal with that, I suppose, the rest yeah. of our careers. The, uh, uh, it really does seem that there is tremendous human potential. That's there? right. No doubt about it. And we're just not unlocking the the way to actualize that potential nearly as I've well. said again and again that I think I, we have ways now to increase everybody's vocabulary by 10%. Mm -hmm. Not complicated either, but we'd, uh, and that would be an enormous gain in terms of reading ability and so on. Mm -hmm. And I don't see the plans for it. Mm -hmm. I'm, tr I'm trying to formulate some of them myself. But. And then uh, in terms of, of the use of the wide variety of other media, we had that tremendous need to continue to stimulate the critical viewing, the That's critical right. listening, right. uh, the uh, leading a, a life of, of kind of critical examination of all its aspects. Yeah, Socrates said it well a long time ago, the unexamined life is not worth living. 
Yeah, that's. I think the great there are great joys and delights. We don't get to get that far with a lot of our learning. It's sort of plodding and passive and taking examinations, but not enough on the applying side, the evaluating side, and so on. And there's a real delight, I think, in a good deal of that experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, obviously, a uh, rich and complex career such as you've had can't really be detailed in a two-hour session. And uh, yet I think we, uh, we've perhaps tried to give some of the uh, critical uh, elements or, or whatever. I, I would hesitate to call them high points because there have yeah. been a lot of other things that w would be high points. I've tried to follow in, in some of the questions uh, your notion that uh, what we try to do with material is to uncover it rather That's than to cover it. And uh, we'll hope that others will work to uncover all the other related things uh, by reading the material available in the Arnold Press reprints and the other uh, currently available things uh, and, and uh, uh, some of the other kind of tapes in this series that Etc. Foundation uh, is, is going to produce. So I certainly do want to thank you for your time and energy and uh, full cooperation in this effort. Uh, it's certainly been a pleasure to talk with you this morning. I've enjoyed it. I found it very stimulating. This was an interview with Edgar Dale on April 8th, 1977 at The Ohio State University for the ECT Foundation Oral History Project.